Welcome to Wise Up Governance and Boards podcast, brought to you by Three Wise Owls Governance Consultants, covering hot topics in governance, risk, latest regulatory changes, and issues keeping directors and executives awake at night. Here are your hosts, Ainsley Cunningham and Deb Anderson. Welcome to another episode of Wise Up. Today, we're joined by Fran Finucane, Company Secretary from Collins Foods Limited. Fran is a confident, personable and results-oriented senior professional with a proven track record in high-level relationship management, corporate governance and provision of policy advice on complex regulatory issues. Her experience in legal, commercial and corporate governance across industries has been gained whilst working in legal, regulatory and company secretarial roles in Australia over 17 years including a rare opportunity working as a senior listings advisor in market supervision at the Australian Securities Exchange. Fran is recognised by internal and external stakeholders as an approachable, valued business partner sharing know-how and best practice in corporate governance. She is a graduate of the Australian Institute of Company Directors, GAICD, Fellow of the Governance Institute of Australia and admitted as a solicitor in Queensland. Welcome, Fran. Thanks for having me. Welcome. So, tell us a little bit about Fran Finucane. So, I, um, I think most people would say that their careers have not followed the usual path, but I truly believe that my opportunities have been unique. Um, and so, I started my career as, as a lawyer as the last cohort to do or have the ability to choose articles of clerkship to become qualified as a lawyer. And and in that time, I was given the opportunity to rotate through three different areas of practice and really really design and and come out as a well-rounded practitioner. Shortly after I was qualified, I was given the opportunity to go and work in-house in a financial services ASX 20 company for a short time. And that gave me an insight into what life on the other side is a, of a lawyer is like, where you are providing real time, real advice to the business so that they can go out and get on with doing what they're good at, which is making money. And so that, as a junior lawyer, was, was immensely valuable and gave me a taste of what life can be like and showed me how to be more commercial and real with the advice that I was writing for those clients. And... And then whilst I was out on secondment, um, the opportunity came to apply for a role as an advisor at the ASX office in Brisbane in the days when we had an ASX office here in Brisbane and Adelaide. And, and that, was, that was one of those moments where I just thought to myself, oh, that is an opportunity of a lifetime. I really need to throw my hat in the ring for that. And so I did. And six years... Um, Six years I spent uh, at the ASX listing office and really just loved it. It was one of the most interesting, varied, dynamic environments to work in. Um, Being part of these companies' stories from when they first listed on ASX, processing that application, seeing their their successes and then helping them through some of the more challenging times as well. Um, Being able to build those relationships and see how different companies and businesses across different sectors and um, sizes operated and how they made decisions um, and really seeing the good, the bad and the ugly as well. So it was really an interesting journey to have that time there. And then as... um, many listeners might know the ASX Brisbane and Adelaide offices were um, closed and I had a time, I was um, invited to go and work as an acting assistant company secretary for an ASX 50 which was just the most brilliant opportunity because as I'd learned in my time at ASX the company secretary really has a very similar job to what I had at ASX, which was a role that's across so many different areas and you had so many different touch points and a seat at the table where the decisions were being made and a real opportunity to learn from really clever people. Um, 
executive and non-executive alike. And from there, then was given the opportunity to take the company secretary role at, at Collins Foods and, and here I am seven and a half years later. How exciting, Fran. And um, so how have you found um, kind of juggling those sorts of roles with um, as a mum growing a family at the same time and um, obviously they're sort of um, high pressure environments, large ASX listed entities at the top end of town. Um, how have you found that? It's been a juggle, I won't lie. Um, I'm supported by you know, my my husband is is very much a team player, and so very early on in my career, we we decided that if we were going to go down this this path of having a corporate career, because it's a joint decision, um, that we needed to really work as a team and and go with the ebbs and flows and have the ability to flex. And um, you know, it takes a village to raise children. It takes a very large village to help raise children, and so along the way, we've we've have had been very fortunate to have lots of um, female and male um, mentors who have who've given me suggestions on different ways that um, you can manage a, a high, highly successful corporate career as well as have a family. And so Collins Foods had its AGM virtually in August. Yes. Tell us how that went. Yes, yeah, so we had, we had a hybrid AGM um, for some from specific reasons we chose to go hybrid as opposed to completely virtual and it was very successful. It was the first hybrid um, AGM with any virtual component for the company and so that in itself was was exciting. Um, There are many, I think anyone who says that it's easier doing a virtual event never had to hold a virtual event. (laughs) Um, there are so many mm. more factors that one needs to think of, but really if you're, if you're supported by the right kind of part business partners who are invested in your success as well, then you will come out successful at the other end, which we did. Um, we had very positive feedback from our investors who were grateful that they could join us online um, despite the COVID environment that we live in. Um, and it provided a very transparent way of questions being asked and answered. Um, and as much as possible, we tried to keep it like it was the same format as though we were having it in person. And with um, COVID this year, Fran, how has that presented different challenges or opportunities for um, holding board meetings and um, getting on with the business? Yes, and so... A similar situation as though we had with the AGM. Half of my, actually the majority of my board are not located in Queensland. So not being able to travel and be in person presented the unique opportunity of making use of this wonderful technology that we have. And so we had, we had to very quickly flip to having virtual board meetings. And um, whilst, you know, some people might say that it's, it's less engaging and it's less personal. It can be to an extent in that you're not in the same room, but really they're on the screen with you maybe only about 20 or 30 centimetres away. So in reality, I think it can be more engaging. And did you find that you had to have more meetings? Yes. So during we did have, we flipped to having weekly board meetings, um, regular catch-ups, and that really helped with management being able to be agile with its decision making um, and really draw on that diverse experience that our board has. Our board's very diverse and balanced in terms of its skills and experience. And so I think having those different views and being able to navigate through that very difficult time was, was of great benefit. And I think it's a wonderful opportunity for directors as well to kind of sink their teeth into um, providing that um, knowledge and experience as well through these sorts of times. Yes, definitely. And you know, many of these, uh, my board is completely non-executive. And so the views that they bring are not just those learned from Colin being a director of Collins Foods. So we have lots of not-for-profit, um, private, not-listed company and listed company experience that was being shared at the table. And it was, it 
it was really a, a really amazing thing to watch and learn and be a part of and contribute to um, such a diverse range of thought and then and then to be able to put that into a context where you know, we have a workforce of more than 13,000 employees across various countries in the world. So to be able to see that experience come and say this is the best decision for our people and the business was really quite an amazing thing and special thing to be a part of. And how have, um, you mentioned a really large workforce, how has it been um, from a, um, I guess, mental health perspective and just taking, um, you know, in some instances probably a lot of a younger employee um, age group through this journey, which was probably the first they've ever seen in their lifetime? Yes, it was very, very much the forefront of the board and, and management's minds. Um, so everything from how do you get the workforce used to working from home, for example. Some some of our support centre employees had never worked from home before and so there was the challenge of getting them used to the idea of you might not be travelling to the office but you're still working and so the challenges of working with that when you have young children working around you as well um, how do you how do you make sure that they are taking time out and not just sitting at that desk all the time um, and you know, for, for our operators who are at the front line how do we make sure that it's still safe to open the restaurant that it's still safe to serve continue to serve food and you know with such a young workforce as well there are also the parental considerations and so it can be quite tricky. Mm. So how many um, franchises are there in the Collins Food Group, Fran? So we have the KFC and the Taco Bell franchises um, and recently um, market would have seen that we've made a decision to close the Sizzler Australia brand in Australia. It still operates very strongly in Thailand and Japan. So with um, COVID, how have the franchisors coped? So the franchisors have been of a great support to us. Um, that's one of the benefits of being a franchisee for a very big brand like KFC and Taco Bell. We've we've really been able to borrow on that experience and that resource to make sure that we can keep our workforce safe and and our customers safe, and we move very be able to move very quickly to a contactless and delivery model. Um, for our product. And have you found um, different countries have responded differently? Uh, the franchise has been consistent across all of the markets. Mm. And so uh, there is you know, there is the, the global brand and then there's local representation. Um, I think that the pace at which development has happened has been different. So obviously, you know, depending upon the number of cases in, in the country... Um, their response is going, was, was different, but largely the way that um, processes were rolled out was very consistent. And have you found it really challenging during this time to stay abreast of information? Because at one stage there, um, it was changing, you know, daily in some regards, you know, um, closures, COVID safe plans. Um, now, obviously, with... Um, uh, reopenings and things like that and um, different phases with different states and how are you managing to stay abreast of all of those changes? So that's one of the benefits of working with a very strong management team as well as having that support from a very competent um, franchisor in that you have lots of subject matter experts who then are on point for distilling that information and so we would divide the information that was coming in and pick a source of truth and then it would be fed into our weekly crisis team um, which we would then all take um, learnings and share information in that forum and agree a course of action. So for example um, our quality assurance manager would be taking information in relation to food safety and making sure that our processes and procedures were matching those requirements. Um, Work health safety was working very closely with all of the government bodies to make sure that um, 
you know, information and requirements around masks and um, uh, contactless delivery methods were appropriate. Um, and then operations, of course, have a very important role to play to make sure that those those methods can be deployed safely across all of our employees. And then, of course, there are the board duties, which was um, distilled through myself with ASX and our legal advisors for making sure that we were all still making our appropriate disclosures as required. So um, you touched on it briefly before, Fran, but um, going back to your uh, listings advisor role at the ASX, how does it feel to be... um, sort of on one side of the fence to the, another to now a, sort of a different um, diverse role? It's been incredibly interesting because I think one of one, the most interesting factors is that I listed Collins Foods as a, <laughs> as a listings advisor back in the day, 2011. So that was, that was really nice to then be asked to apply for the role as company secretary for Collins Foods because I already knew a little bit about it and and um, as a listings advisor as well, knew that from a corporate governance perspective, they were on point. And so to then be offered the opportunity to, to go in-house and work with a, a board and, and directly in business again and add value there was, was truly a privilege. And what are some of the lessons you've learnt from um, your role at the ASX to now um, transition those and have those transferable skills within Collins Foods? Uh, so I think being able to look at big picture and what is best practice and then look at how things work in a, in a commercial context and then apply that in the best possible way so that it's... I mean, governance is one of those things that's the same as risk management, that when it's working well, you don't notice it. And that's, and that's you know, the way that it adds value in that it's not a roadblock to decision making it's not a roadblock to the business getting on with its job um, sometimes that can be you know, it's a double-edged sword <laughs> um, but it's 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 really interesting the way that um, it can be a it, I like the way that Australia has a not one size fits all it's a if not why not way of um, applying corporate governance. Um, So in terms of um, the changes to the ASX listing rules and the rollout of the fourth edition of the Corporate Governance Council principles and recommendations, obviously um, some of those things have been um, challenged with COVID and the pandemic and um, kind of the rollout and implementation of some of those things. But how have you found um, kind of implementing some of those changes for... Collins Foods? I think that, well, Collins Foods has um, maintained, always maintained that it will be at best practice governance. And so being our already at that, functioning at that level meant that there was not a lot that we had to change in terms of the new fourth edition. Um, so it was really a natural thing to to build upon and Governance is one of those things of where it's always a process of continual improvement. And are you impacted by the new modern slavery reporting obligations? We certainly are. <laughs> <laughs> and how have you found that um, kind of process? Um... So that's been a very interesting process because our supply chain as a franchisee is managed by the franchisor. And so for us, it was a matter of working very closely with the franchisor to understand in further detail how the human aspects of supply chain are mapped. We have a very in-depth and engaged supply chain because of our food safety obligations and requirements. Um, So to extend it to the human side of things was, was a large project to undertake, but one that we could we could do hand in hand with our franchisors. And how have you found the results of that? Um, has it been um, beneficial to them to kind of go through that process? For the franchisors, it's been very, I think it's been beneficial for all of us to understand that our supply chain is as we have understood it to be. And how long has that process taken, Fran? Because it's We quite embarked a bit of on the process about a year ago. Wow. Um, and we're we're 
we've undertaken that we will release our um, statement to the Office of Home Affairs before the end of the calendar year. But yeah, it's been quite a process. Mm. And obviously it's something that will probably continue to evolve over time as well with future reporting periods. Yes, it's one of those things that is, is never a job done. Mm. Um, it's always it's a process of continual improvement and, and I think that that's um, one of the benefits of having having it written in a way that it's not a sunset clause um, that really helps and, and is of benefit so that we can all understand that it is a process of continual improvement. Mm. Um, and our requirements here in Australia are a lot more prescriptive than what they are in overseas jurisdictions such as the UK. Um, and so that, that in itself has uh, made it easier, I think, um, to represent the supply chain and, and really share how the supply chain works. So in terms of um, crisis management and business continuity planning, um, obviously a lot of businesses uh, didn't have the foresight of a pandemic ever playing out in their lifetime. So, um, you know, we've sort of found that a lot of businesses hadn't planned for these types of events. How did um, Collins plan for this event and it were, has sort of, I guess, business continuity plans being tested and now potentially being strengthened off the back of this? Yes, I think it's it's interesting that some people will say that, well, nobody could ever have had the foresight to think that you know, a biological pandemic would be on their risk register. I think that misses the point in a little, in a, in a way, because you can never have everything on your risk register. What you can do is is map out what catastrophic or a major event looks like for your business. And from there, if you know what that is going to look like, then you can plan uh, or do some planning around how you are going to recover from that event because at least you were agreed as to what is catastrophic and what is major and you've had those really detailed discussions and important discussions up front and then you then you have a plan in place that will flex depending upon what your circumstances are. And so with Collins Foods, um, I I don't like to use the word by happenstance, but um, two weeks before the lockdown here in Queensland, we had actually had a a scenario um, where we had done some scenario training to test and practice our crisis management um, manual and um, a week later after that we actually had a, we had a case where we, we put that plan through its real paces and so we'd already had a practice run and then we, we were able to redeploy it and then fine tune it again and then from there we fine tuned it again so it's been very interesting in terms of um, having that plan in place and knowing that we'd done those simulations and just how close the actual event was to what we had planned. Mm. The timing was perfect. It was. (laughs) (laughs) How's the transition back to working in the office going for your employees? I think that many are quite happy to be back, really happy to be seeing, seeing our colleagues and working in person. Many have taken the opportunity too, though, to have that time where they can work from home um, and you know, take the, the opportunity to work flexibly. Um, many with young families, such as myself, appreciate the, the reduction to the commute time to and from the office. Um, so it's, it's worked well. Yeah, I think it has been a real opportunity for businesses to even um, revisit their, um, I guess, corporate office footprint as well and potentially change some of the dynamics within the workplace. What's, what are some of the other things that um, have been high priority in the sort of for the focus for the board? Other than going virtual, as we've already discussed, mm. really, um, and having the more frequent board meetings, which we've now been able to pull back because it's sort of gotten into a, a cadence again. Mm. Um, it's, yeah. Have you had to revisit your insurance program? No, have you gone through renewal yet? We have. <laughs> Is that Is it, did that a present bit more challenging? Yeah. 
<laughs> well, the insurance market is certainly tightened in yeah. the DNO space. Yeah, definitely. What about mental health of employees? Have you had any challenges there? They all coped pretty well? Well, as an executive team and senior leadership team, we were checking in regularly with our with our team members and we've recently launched a, a wellbeing challenge as part of that and, and certainly participated in the Are You OK Day messaging. And sort of, I guess, now coming out of, um, especially for Queensland, um, you know, we're coming up to stage four and five recovery phases. Um, are you seeing a more... Um, focus and attention now put towards um, strengthening business models and sort of getting out of that survival phase and now back into a thriving type environment or? I think it's still quite a conservative approach that's being taken but at the same time trying to make sure that organisational performance isn't being cut short because of it so certainly there's more testing of budgets and so forth but in terms of um, Being overly aggressive, I would agree. There's not much, you know, high risk. There's, there's not, wouldn't be a lot of high risk being taken. Mm. And um, with kind of incentive plans and things like that, there's sort of been a focus in the market on remuneration practices and, you know, really kind of honing in on um, exec rem and, um, you know, is that kind of having an effect or impact on um, your workplace? Oh, so there was a f- you know, the focus on executive remuneration has been. I mean, we haven't been, um, we haven't escaped that um, that review. But for our part, um, you know, we've there's been very clear disclosure in our financials as well as in our uh, material and discussions with investors as to what we did and didn't receive in t- in that space. I think it's very very important to be transparent about what it is that the company is receiving. Mm. So for, I guess, other organisations that might be, um, I guess, yet to go through their AGM season yet, are there any sort of um, top tips or um, practical experience that um, they might be able to apply in their own businesses? At Collins Foods, we, we've had a ro- we've got a, quite a robust um, engagement program um, that we run before an AGM with both retail and institutional investors. And so I think it's really, it's, it's been running for the last seven years and I think it's, quite, it's been quite interesting um, and important in terms of gauging investor sentiment. And so for us it's, it's been really valuable to, and I think in, valuable to our investors as well, to have that open and open communication and so it's you know, they're not a surprise when issues when issues come, and we're able to as well as a board and, and management team to address those concerns in real time and work with them to come to a solution that's that's right for everybody. So in terms of um, investors um, and attracting sort of institutional investment and things like that, a lot of their mandates have changed over time and you've sort of seen, um, you know, the investor letter that gets put out by Larry Fink and things like that and they kind of um, have mandated more around ESG type targets and ethical investment opportunities and how how are you finding that kind of um, impacting on your space? We've certainly had a lot more questions around ESG and there's there's been a lot more interest around that's um, what Collins is doing in that space. And so that's something that that we're we're working through as a board and as and as an executive. So um, being out of the office, being part of an executive team, how have you found um, collaboration um, being amongst your peers? It's one of the beauties of technology. I know that there's nothing quite like working in person and, and on a face-to-face basis, but at least with all of the video technology that's around, we can still see each other's faces, hear each other's voices, um, and that's that's been of benefit as well. 
um, open and communication has certainly been more frequent um, and has you know taken the f- lots of different forms actually not just you know not just traditional telephone um, or email communications it's coming in the form of chats or um, video conferencing as I mentioned as well so it's it's been interesting the the different tools that have been made available you get to meet family members and <laughs> Dogs, Dogs and, and cats. cats and <laughs> yeah. Hearing Children. The, yes, yes. The sirens going past. Yes, it's been very much a challenge for everyone, I think, and a new way of working. But um, I guess with um, such an extensive career across a diverse range of roles, um, before we sort of wrap up today, what are kind of the top three tips that you could leave um, other governance professionals with of just kind of managing the function to um, obviously such a high level of standard within Collins Foods Group? Um, so for the up-and-coming professional, I would say look for every opportunity to do something different and that might not be an everyday offering. If I had not had thrown my ring into the hat for ASX and just kept on with my legal career, it's, I would never have, I probably would not have ended up as, as a governance professional, company secretary for a listed company for starters. Um, and then for the existing professional, with so much information, it's quite, it's, it's quite honestly like a fire hydrant at the moment with all of the information coming at us. And so picking just one source of truth for each of your buckets of information I think has been really invaluable, um, one source of truth, and then distilling that information down into bite-sized pieces so that the business and directors and management alike can use it in a meaningful way. Great advice. Thank you so much, Fran, for joining us today. Thanks, Fran. Thank you for having me. That's all for today. Until next time, happy podcasting. And remember, if you're enjoying the show, check out our other episodes and all things governance at www.3wiseowls.com.au.